So, I'd like to tell you today a story, a story of a princess, of a Roman princess who was the daughter of an emperor, she married a barbarian king, she became queen of the gods, the barbarians. Then, after a series of stories of battles and um, disasters and, and many things, she became empress of Rome the first and the only empress of the Western Roman Empire. Her name was Galla Placidia. Let me show you something about her, her name, Galla Placidia, and an image which you may take as representing a woman of that period, but she's not her. This is another lady from somewhere else, she's not Gala Placidia, but it gives you some idea of how women would dress. High-ranking, noble, probably, women with typical peers, a necklace of peers was very typical of that age, uh, because it was expensive. Mm, would come from the Persian Gulf or somewhere, the Indian Ocean, so very expensive. and and uh, more expensive than gold, nobody in this age would dream of wearing gold. But what ages are this? Is the last century of the Roman Empire, the final century of the Roman Empire, an age of adventures, of battles, of conflicts, of decay, and eventually the empire disappeared, but we have embedded in the general story of the, of the Roman Empire we have the story of this woman, Galla Placidia, the last empress, and what she did, which I think is a very interesting story to tell because you will see that she was empress for 30 years, she did things, she was not a doll, not a doll dressed in imperial clothes, she was a very strong woman, and I think what she did was to propel the empire to the next stage of what was to be Western Europe, the Middle Ages. And in my opinion, Galla Placidia is the mother of the Middle Ages. I'll tell you the story. Takes a little while. We have to learn a lot of things about the period and about her. And this is Galla. See? We have a portrait of her. Probably even reasonably faithful. Mm. We see she has two necklaces, two rings of peers on her neck and more peers on her head. So she was very rich. She was the daughter of the emperor. She was a princess. She had the official title of Puella, Puella girl, nobilissima, most noble girl. Very noble. <laughs> Not everybody uh, is the daughter of an emperor. So. Let's go back. Let's go to those times. And Rome, 5th century, beginning of the 5th century. This is Rome, of course, Rome today, obviously. And what are we looking here is the modern Rome. You probably recognize it if you have ever been there. This is the center. It's a, today is a big city, more more than a million inhabitants. At the time of the most um, splendid times of the Roman Empire, Rome was uh, probably a million inhabitants, maybe a little less, but still a big city, the biggest city in Western Europe the capital of the empire, and from that not so much smaller than it is now. This, you see the Tiber River here, and it occupied, at the time of Galla, Galla Placidia, occupied more or less this area, and we can still recognize places where she, she must have seen the, these places, the Colosseum, you know this, you, this is one of the most famous buildings in Rome. When you think of ancient Rome, you think of the Colosseum at the age of Galla, Galla Placidia. Uh, there was no more gladiator games. They had been abolished, in part because Rome had become Christian, in part, in part because 
gladiator games were expensive and so the, the Romans could not afford them any longer. And that's part of the story, but there was more. There is a lot left of those times. You see here, this is the Forum. This is mostly ruins, but you see this building here? This is the Curia, the place where the Roman Senate would collect. And the curious thing, it is still standing there. You could still walk into this building where, mm, 2,000 years ago, um, the Romans, Roman Senate would collect. And uh, just to tell you how many things are left of this period, just just let you see that uh, that Galla Placidia would walk here and she would find things. She would still there. You see this building here? Let me show it to you. What you have noticed? You have been to Rome. Have you ever noticed this building? This is a little bit out of uh, orientation with the rest of the of the buildings. These are all modern buildings. This is a very ancient building. It was there already during the third century, or the fourth century probably. It is the Basilica, the church of San Vitale. And uh, for sure, Placidia, she must have been here. She has seen this place. She walked into this church. So you have this things and, um, and you have this feeling of history which is still alive 1500 years after this lady Galla Placidia we still find traces of her very little very little because very little is written about her story but but we find things and so we go back to the map to dimension and let's go back to the year for 10 for 10 410 and you have to imagine that the ancient city of rome was surrounded by an army of barbarians the gods coming from the north led by king alaric besiege rome uh, where is the emperor the emperor is gone the emperor is not here the emperor is hiding in another city which is ravenna ravenna is a smaller city but it is the protected by swamps and it is on the sea and it has the advantage that if things really go bad the emperor can take a boat a ship and escape a room is left nearly undefended and so this is uh, the romans wow what's happening now what's happening here it's why is that Rome is surrounded by barbarians. This cannot be, it's impossible. And yet, in 410 AD, it was happening. So, this is a moment, one of those moments in history which are very strange. The Romans go crazy. That's that. well, what's that? This is not possible. It's possible that there is an army of barbarians in front of this city and we cannot do anything about that. And yet, they cannot. They do. They go crazy. They start accusing people, oh, well, you did a betrayal, somebody's a traitor. They, they raise a new emperor, somebody who, oh, I am the emperor, but you should be scared of me. And you have one of those details of history which make the fascination of history. So the Romans have this Attalus goes to see the king of the barbarians and say, well, I am the emperor. And uh, so what do you want from me? I, we, are many, we Romans are many. We will defeat you. And the king looks at him and says, the more, the thicker the hay, the best it is mowed. <laughs> it's all those things, things that is reported by the historians. Probably true, <laughs> because the king had an army, the emperor, this pseudo emperor had no army. So, and here during this period we have Galla Placidia. At that time, about twenty years old, she was in Rome, and she was the highest ranking noble in Rome. Not the most powerful because she was a, she was a girl, but the highest ranking noble. So at that moment of confusion, who else was in Rome? Uh, the story needs to be told because it's one of those fascinating stories that makes history. It, you read history like a novel, like, a, okay, look at this lady. See this lady? Let me go back to to another view. Okay, this impressively looking lady. Uh, she gives us some idea of how 
Placidia might have been dressed. This, this dress was called the palla. It's very solemn. And this lady is a noble woman. She has two um, necklaces of pearls around her neck. And we know her name. She is Serena. Serena was the cousin of Galla, Galla Placidia. And this, this boy is her son, uh, Eucarius. Who is this lady? She is the older than Placidia. And she was a stepmother to her because Placidia's father, the Emperor Theodosius the Great, died young, so she, he left Placidia in charge of Serena, her uh, niece, his, his niece. And uh, Serena was the wife of this impressive gentleman. Here you see him. This is Stilico. You may have heard the name Stilico, the general. He was a very important person. The Magister Militum. Magister Militum means the commander in chief of the army. And he was one of the last successful Roman generals. He defeated the Goths once. Big defeat for the Goths, what was, was called the last Roman army. It was not the last, but the last powerful Roman army. So, because he was so successful, Stilico, then the emperor of the time, whose name was Honorius, he told him, I don't want to have a successful general around, and he had him killed for treason. And so, that's the reason why Rome was besieged because Stilico, the commander-in-chief, had been killed and many, um, he was a barbarian, he was a vandal, many soldiers of the army were vandals or barbarians, so they were, they, they were commanded by a barbarian. Barbarian simply meant, meant foreign, that didn't mean that, that they were horned helmets and things like that, just mean foreign. Here you see this Stilico is dressed like a Roman citizen, a very nice dress of Roman dress. <coughs> and so, you kill the general, the army disperses. And so, Italy was left without defense. The barbarians, the Goths, the foreigners, poured in and besieged um, Rome. And then, if Stilico was a, a traitor, well, then somebody decided, well, maybe also Serena was a traitor. See? Maybe we should kill Serena, too. Well, let's kill her. <laughs> and so, but Serena is the cousin of Galla Placidia. Should we ask uh, Galla Placidia if it is okay to kill her cousin? Where well, they go ask her. <laughs> well, the story is, is strange. We don't know exactly what happened. There is a one historian who tells us the Roman Senate went to see Galla Placidia and said, Can we kill your cousin for treason? He said, yes, maybe. But he tells us something about Placidia. She was very resilient. You see, a lot of adventures she went through, but she survived. <laughs> she passed the worst things but she's because she was tough. And so I can imagine if this story is true, because we cannot be sure, maybe it's true, but maybe it's propaganda, we can be sure that she did it if she said, yes, kill my aunt, if you, my cousin, cousin, sorry, if you like, but because she could see, well, even if they say no, they'll kill her anyway, if I say no, they will kill me too, Placidia, so smart. And so they kill poor uh, Serena, nothing happens, of course, and... The, the barbarians eventually get into Rome and they sack it. It's an event, the, the event of the century. You know that uh, Augustine, Saint Augustine, was living at that time in Africa, in Hippona, near Carthage. He wrote the city of God, inspired by the fall, the fall of Rome, because it, doesn't, it was such a shock that he had to write a book saying, well, it doesn't matter if the city the real city falls, but the city of God remains. It's a book that you can still read today. We do read it, this book today. This is the 5th century. Still has an effect on us, even though so little is left. So what happens here? 
the, the goats go in, start sacking, robbing, and ruining a few things. Uh, destroy, no, they're not so ill-behaved. The, 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 there is an agreement. Okay, you steal a little, a little, please, but then you leave. Okay, well, then we steal a little, and then we leave. All right. And then they leave, <laughs> but they stole gold and silver, whatever they could find. But they take with them who... Gala Placidia. <laughs> she goes with them, and there is no evidence that she went kicking and screaming. They took her. Well, she, no, she, she went with them. We don't know really what passed. We, we have no idea. But she, there is no evidence that she was unwilling to follow the barbarians. But maybe she thought she was fun. She was young. She was 22, maybe. And uh, it was an, an adventure, can you imagine, to go with the barbarians in an adventure. And what, what, what adventure was that? Well, the barbarians had this idea, we go, they always had a problem of finding food. So where do we find food? Italy at that time was a disaster, there was no more agriculture, they the populated the wars and famines and things. And so they say, well, we go all the way down and we cross the Mediterranean Sea and we go to Africa. Africa at that time was green and producing a lot of wheat, a lot of grain, and it was Africa that was feeding Rome. And so they said, well, let's go where the food is. And so they went all the way down, slowly going through the mountains and the rivers and the destroyed cities and the no roads. So they went. And at some moment, at some moment, they arrive in this region and things happen, bad things happen to the barbarians because the, the king, Alaric, dies and uh, the, the boats uh, that should have taken the barbarians across the sea, they disappear, something goes wrong and the king dies and uh, the story is that the king is buried in the Busento River. This is the Busento River. And so of course they deviate um, the, the river, they bury the king and with the gold, with his share of gold sacked in Rome, and then they bring the river uh, back to its um, riverbed. And see the <laughs> epic stories. This, this gold of the gods buried under the Busento. And uh, people have been looking for this gold for 2,000, not 1,500 years. <laughs> maybe somebody found it. Maybe it is still there. Maybe it has never existed. We don't know. And we cannot know. But anyway, at this point, the brother of the dead king, whose name is Atawulf, which means the wolf, the wolf they becomes the king. And so say, so what do we do? You know, we cannot go to Africa anymore. And so we had to go somewhere else. And they slowly, slowly, slowly retrace their way up north. But at this time, uh, uh, there was a problem of uh, problems of food, problems of uh, power, because at this point, the Roman had rebuilt their forces and say, so, okay, no way that you can take Rome again. No, 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 we just passed through. And they try to find an agreement. They they move, they move here, they move there, they battle their things. Eventually, they think it's not a good idea to stay in Italy because in Italy there are too many Romans. So they cross to France, southern France. They have followed by a Roman army. And so say, we, okay, we go, we go, we go. Yes, 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 yes. And <coughs> they try try to take Marseille, Marseille, you know, the city on the on the Gulf here, which is at that time was uh, was an important port city. And the, the barbarians, they, at this point, they were a little weak because they could take Rome a few years before, a couple of years before, but now they cannot take Marseille. But they can go to Narbonne. Here and there we go. The, 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 the city of Narbonne actually 
doesn't they don't they don't need a siege um, they just go there and they seem to find they are welcomed in the city because 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 we and and uh, Narbonne is now small there is very little left of the Roman times but I think the Roman square is here there was a the river Ob Ode here and this is probably the Roma Square, the original Roma Square. There's very little left of that, but what happens here is that Placidia, the noble, the high noble Placidia, and the king of the gods, Ataulf, get married. <laughs> That's the romantic part. Well, of course, it was not so romantic there was a lot of politics involved but we don't know but maybe there was something romantic if you like to think of gala placidia as a beautiful girl um, we don't know if she was beautiful we have only this portrait of her was she beautiful mm, we have no idea really we we can only say that uh, she was the daughter of uh, theodosius who was not not so beautiful possibly this is Theodosius, you see him here, maybe you see him, no that's not, there is, there it is, mm, we don't see very much, but it doesn't matter, but the mother of Placidia was uh, a French woman called Galla, she was said to be the best looking, the most beautiful woman of the whole Roman Empire, and that's the reason why the emperor married her because uh, emperors tend to marry beautiful women and beautiful women tend to like to marry emperors it works anyway there is a ceremony right here in this square some we are in uh, four, 412 413 something like that and things like that placidia maybe is 23 they get married um, Ataulf is a little older, but we don't know exactly. We don't have portraits of uh, of Ataulf, um, probably a handsome man. Why not? And there's this big marriage, also these details that the historians tell us. It's it's fantastic. It tells you such details about what was the what were the gifts in the marriage, and see that Ataulf want to play the the emperor, the part of the emperor brought the gold that the gods had stolen in Rome and gave it to Placidia as a gift and uh, and they even had you remember I told you there was a pseudo emperor somebody named Attalus okay somehow Attalus was there and they invited it to, to the marriage already you have a former emperor as in, uh, at your marriage it is something and uh, they have Attalus sing for the for the married couple and that's uh, also not so little to have an emperor singing at your marriage okay and there we go and uh, the story the story is still long and complex and they, they cannot stay there because the romans are a little angry they they, they they don't want to see they don't want to see the barbarians and eventually they had to run away from the barbarians and eventually they find refuge somewhere here i have to find it in Barcelona at uh, the time called Barcino Barcino here it is which at uh, that uh, today is a big city it's enormous but that at that time it was um, a fortified city uh, that where they find refuge they stay there and uh, and um, but see as a, as, a, as a child gets pregnant as a child and the trick they call him Theodosius Theodosius was Theodosius the Great Placidia's father and uh, this Theodosius is the grandson of the big the great Theodosius so the idea not not a simple idea can you think what Placidia had in mind Theodosius the little Theodosius was the son of the king and the queen of the gods and at the same time the grandson of the emperor of rome so he was in principle the heir heir of both of the kingdom of the gods and of the em roman empire we can only imagine what could have happened if if had it had worked 
because maybe, and I think it's pretty possible that Placidia had in mind to start a Gothic Roman dynasty that would have ruled the empire, ruled the empire and changed history from scratch, maybe. But that didn't happen because, see, up to now you see that Placidia goes, Placidia's story goes up and down like a movie. Movies go up and down. It's the hero seems to be winning, then the bad guy seems to be winning, the hero is back in shape, then the bad guys come back. And it is like that for the story of Gala Placidia. Now she had a high mother of a prince of the gods, queen of the gods. Not bad. She, she was always happy to be queen of the gods. She never said I didn't like that. She was very happy to have been queen of the gods. She liked the gods. She married one. And at this point, unfortunately, poor Theodosius mo did dies. And uh, that's it. And that, at that point, something happens that uh, Atawulf is killed in a palace conspiracy. There were probably some political struggle there. The, the Atawulf tried to, always tried to have to negotiate with the Romans. Some, there was a war party and a new king appeared, his name was Sigaric. Sigaric was a, mm, a bad guy, probably, <laughs> and he didn't like Placidia, you are a traitor, you, you, you are here to betray us, and so he tried to, to do the, all the worst things to Placidia, including making her work in front of a horse for miles. And uh, Placidia survived, because as I said, this is the ancient Barcelona, Barcino, the ancient Roman city was somewhere around here. You can still find a lot of things which were Roman, but uh, but a lot of time has passed. And uh, also here there is very little left. Probably the Roman city was was around here, somewhere here. Somewhere here there's still places that you can find where probably Placidia walked. She stayed here just a couple of years, but she saw the city, she saw these places. And and it was a bad time for her, things go, but things change again. At this point there arrives an army, a Roman army arrives here in front of Barcino and they start saying, now we discuss. And the gods are not stupid, they say, yes, Mr. Who, who is the boss there? They say, well, I am Constantius, general, Ma Magister Militum, I am in, at this Constantius. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Constantius, what what would you like to have from from what can what can we do for you? First, you get rid of Sigari, sure. And they had a new king, more pliant, of course, somebody called Valia, Valia, what is that? And say, then you give me back the gold that you stole in Rome. You really want you really want all of it? Um, not really. Let's say half and half, but you give me also Placidia. Hmm. Sure, Mr. Constantius, here is the gold, here is Placidia, you happy? Uh, yes, okay, and I'll give you also some food, great. And so they find an agreement, Constantius takes Placidia and some gold, and they go back to Italy with Placidia. Placidia, it seems that Constantius was an um, ancient um, fiancé or suitor, or anyway, he liked Placidia. <laughs> So there, there is a logic, you know, this kind of things. This Constantius they go back not to Rome, this Rome was dangerous. Uh, they go to Ravenna. I told you that in Ravenna was at that time the place where the emperors stayed. There we go, Ravenna. This is Ravenna today, as you can still see the Roman city more or less here. At that time of Placidia and the Constantius, the sea arrived all the way to here. So Ravenna was uh, also. You see all these these um, fields here. They are they are uh, fields now, but that time they were mostly swamps. So for the um, armies, it was a difficult it was difficult to besiege Ravenna. And as I said, if things really went bad, the emperor could take a ship and, and go and sail away. And so it was <laughs> a fortified city. I don't think it was a good, a great place to be. But anyway, and you had to be happy with what you, what you found. And uh, and so they, they, there is a little problem now. Here you have that. Uh, you have an empress, potential empress, Puella nobilissima, 
daughter of Theodosius, so potential empress, that you have an emperor, Honorius, who was another son of Theodosius. They were half-brothers, Honorius and Placidia. Let me show you Honorius for your curiosity. Let's see if we can, we can find him. Let me show him to you in a little more, a little more like this, okay. This guy here is Honorius, his wife. See, we have the faces of these people, faces just like we have a face of, of Theodosius, the father of Honorius and of Galla Placidia. And there is a little problem here, but as long as there is Constantius in Ravenna, Constantius the general is a um, tough man, and so, uh, they, they nominate themselves co-emperors with Honorius. Honorius is not very happy because up to then he was the only emperor. Then, okay, now the emperors are three, Honorius, Placidia and Constantius. But you think, okay, let's be happy with that then Constantius dies, just after a couple of years. But Placidia has two children from him. Constantius never was really happy to be emperor. Seems he said, wow, too much pomp, too many rules, too many strange dresses. Anyway, he dies and is removed from history. And that is well, what do we do now? Placidia and Honorius. Placidia and Honorius, Placidia and Honorius. Two emperors in this small place. One emperor, one, one empress. They were half-brothers, but that doesn't mean that they liked each other. Why should they? You know the story in the Western movies, old Western movies, you know this town is not big enough for both of us. And, and they fight it out. <laughs> the two half-brothers fight it out. There are some details here, strange also. They say that Placidia tried, tried to seduce his her half-brother and because he was uh, sexually, mm, we don't know, he never had children, it was a little bit strange, but anyway, at some point, they get to fight. <laughs> that not, not themselves, of course, they have, they have bodyguards, they have uh, small armies, Placidias, her bo gothic bodyguards, uh, tough guys, but nevertheless, Honorius as the army, and so he manages to have the upper hand and he chases Placidia away. Placidia, just some moment, we can imagine a very adventurous story here of things that, uh, you know, Placidia, Placidia runs in the, in the streets of Ravenna um, with, his, with their surviving followers. They take a ship, and they board a ship, they, they seize it and they, and they leave. And where do they go? Well, they go to, to where? Uh, where do you go? You are here. And they go to the west, the Eastern Empire. They go to Byzantium, here. Long trip. Arrive here in Byzantium. On the Golden Horn. And, uh, and at that point, At that point, who is ruling Byzantium? It's the another. Before it was ruled by another son of Theodosius, another half brother of Placidia. But then it becomes uh, he dies. Also, Arcadius was his name. And then at some point, it becomes um, ruled by another Theodosius, a grandson of Theodosius the Great who was the, the, the nephew of Placidia. So she, she arrives there with mm, little more than the, than the dress she has around. And she, has, she wears little more than the dress she wears. And she says, hello, my, my nephew, what, uh, what, uh, can you help me? I have some little troubles. And uh, Theodosius thinks about that for a, for a while. In the meantime, Honorius, the Western Emperor, dies and at this point an usurper takes over Ravenna. An usurper takes over Ravenna and Theodosius is worried what the hell this is not, not good because we are all the family of the first Theodosius, Theodosius the Great, so 
Ravenna and the Western Empire must remain with the heirs of Theodosius. Mm, so say, well, you know, you know huh? auntie, what I'm going to do. I'll give you a gift, a little gift. Uh, yes, uh, uh, one army, an entire army, and a general to, to lead it. Ooh, that's good. The general is named Aspar. Aspar. And uh, he retakes Ravenna for you. Uh, you go and uh, and get rid of the stupid usurper whose name is Johannes. Sure, good idea. Let's do it. And so did you see this this story? That it's again Placidia leaves Ravenna with nothing, and she comes back with a whole army and a general. What? What can you ask more? So they go back to Ravenna. There is a battle. Remember that they, they they fight. They they do well, as usual. This this very hard, hard hard times. So. Placidia's army takes back Ravenna. She, she was not leading the army herself, but uh, the, the general, general Aspar was leading for her. She would say, um, Mistress, well, should I should now fight. Okay. And <laughs> they get Ravenna, they capture the usurper. I, I try to do you know, that. They should come <laughs> at the prospect of. of of uh, the Empress, and so me, 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 she, she didn't. She didn't torture him so much. Just cut off one hand, heavy naked on running on a pig in the streets of the city. Not Ravenna, not the city, but that doesn't matter. Torture him, him a little, but not so. But Placidia was Christian, but <laughs> what the times required. So. And then they behead him, of course, they kill him. So at this point, Placidia gets into Ravenna, she's the Empress, and I am the Empress. I am Placidia. I am the Empress of Ravenna! Anyway, good. And now, the roller coaster is over. At this point, we're 420, more or less, Placidia rules for 30 years. 30 years she rules as the Empress. Initially, on behalf behalf of he, her son Valentinian, because a woman was not supposed to rule the empire, and uh, then as Empress Mother, but it is clear that she is at the wheel, absolutely clear. As long as Placidia is in Italy, uh, Empress, she stays. She's in Ravenna, she is in Milano, she is in in Rome, but she rules, no doubt about that, no wars. The Vandals, in the meantime have taken, they did what the gods wanted to do, but they they took North Africa, but uh, they still send grain to Rome, because Rome, as I said, depends on Africa, and and uh, they don't dare, Miss um, Empress, uh, should we keep sending, please do send the grain, we send, <laughs> and um, well, no wars, nobody dares to attack Placidia, which she thought she had this fame of being a tough lady, maybe because she had the usurper so mistreated, cutting hand or um, naked and, uh, on top of a pig, and uh, uh, never mind. 30 years, everything goes well. And then, of course, Placidia at some moment dies. From that moment on, everything goes Berserk. Everything goes to the empire fades. As long as Placidia was there, I let me repeat, she was not a doll dressed like an, a princess, an empress. She was a ruler. She didn't lead empire, uh, armies, but she ruled. And uh, then uh, her son finds a way to get killed, and uh, then after that, uh, still emperor sort of. Um, Period. People in Ravenna say, I am the Emperor! Hey! I am the Emperor! Hey! I am the Emperor! Nobody cares. And um, about 50 years later, the, emperor is, the Empire is gone. No more Empire. People will still think they were in the Empire, Roman Empire, but but uh, but that, that was over. over. For many reasons, essentially, Roma had no more resources to keep the Empire running, so they had to do something to avoid to, to take into account the fact that it was not possible anymore to run such a big empire which was over the whole Mediterranean Sea, it was too big, and you need resources, to, and you didn't have those resources, so the empire had to fade, and it did. 
uh, despite most emperors try to do to avoid that to fight, but that was the wrong the wrong thing to do. Uh, what I think is my opinion about Placidia. Placidia was a very special person in my opinion. She had one capability that others didn't have. They didn't have it. The capability was thinking systemic, thinking dynamic. I said, what do I do here? I am the Empress. What should I do? First duty, make sure that nobody starves. And she did. Second, make sure that they are safe. No worse. But then she thought, well, should I do something more? And I think what she did was to push, to give to the Empire that little push that was needed to get into the Middle Ages. Because the, she destroyed and the empire as a political system. She did it. No, no. She made with a few laws. She made much two stand out. One is that she allowed the local rulers, the local warlords, to collect taxes for themselves. Not anymore. They they would have had to pay their taxes to the empire. No, collect your taxes yourselves. We don't, if you want to give us something, is fine. But you need. Second, he forbade the peasant, peasants to enlist in the army. Peasants had to stay there. They had to cultivate the land. No war. See, stay there. Well, you see, this is Middle Ages. Middle Ages, local warlords, local feuds, and the peasants stay locked to the land. And this assured the Middle Ages. There was no more the time of a centralized <coughs> empire that could be ruled from a single city, could rule everything. Now it was a time of decentralization. They had to rule the empire as a as a whole, and and that uh, um, from the local viewpoint, and that was happening. So why this is one of the reasons why I say that Placidia was the the mother of the Middle Ages, because really, she really ushered in the Middle Ages. She did, uh, by all means, she did. And she was a smart and also another cultural sense she ushered the Middle Ages. It's a detail, but I'd like to, to tell you also this story. Because she left us nothing written, but she left us a monument, which we call the Mausoleum of Galla Placidia. We don't, we have no, we don't know where she is buried. She was, she's not buried in her mausoleum. But, and we have no record about that. But it's called the Mausoleum of Galla Placidia, so it is what must be. And she is, there is clear evidence, I think, in my opinion, that she did it. She had that building built to give us a, um, a message, a message over 1500 years that we can still read this message and uh, we can find the mausoleum in Ravenna. Let's go back to Ravenna. This Google Maps is wonderful. The Romans didn't have it, but uh, but it's it's pretty fantastic. We can fly straight to the mausoleum of Galla Placidia. Um, And uh, see, mm, Bravin has a lot of history, a lot of history. But uh, if you go, 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 you find the mausoleum. Ah, there it is, mausoleum. You see, here, 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 and there it is, mausoleum of Galla Placidia. What's what is this? Not so big. You see, small. Let me show you. This is the building that we call the mall. Not not pretentious. You see, it's a small building, which, however, carries a message. But to understand the message, you have first to understand how the message is carried. Because Placidia, in my opinion, was a woman already was a woman of the Middle Ages. Not a Roman, not so a little, yeah, of course, but she was yet moved into Middle Ages was a period in which people um, esteemed 
spiritual beauty over uh, exterior beauty. Placidia was probably a beautiful woman, as we said, but she was a deeply Christian, and she believed that the internal beauty was much more important. And so when she had this this building built, she wanted to emphasize that the outside, it's, as you see, it's very, very drab. There's nothing here. But you go inside, and inside is fantastic. Let me show you. Wow. Look at the colors of this place. It's absolutely, incredibly, unbelievably fantastic. And if you read the story, you see you have you have some things that you cannot you cannot miss something. This, this is her. She's speaking to you. You go there. You know something about Gala Placidia, and, and you walk in silence. Inside, you hear the vo her voice. You cannot miss it. It is absolutely fantastic. And you you see what. What we see here, these fantastic images, the stars, the stars in the sky. There is a, what does it remind to you? This is Christmas. Christmas or Van Gogh, maybe, but also Christmas. Christmas is, and it is this atmosphere, this Christmas atmosphere, typically of Middle Ages. And it starts here. The fact that we have Christmas with the stars, with this moment of joy, with this moment of beauty, this moment of uh, internal of love. And that because it is the inner spiritual in um, things that we have inside. We have all inside. And uh, this is, this building, in my opinion, is the start of the Middle Ages. And uh, see, so this is the story that, uh, that you could take hours to explain how every everything in this mausoleum tells us something about Gala Placis so modern, so close to us. You can you can hear, feel her. She, she shows you her life, her loves, her feelings, her suffering a little because she had a, she had a difficult life. And uh, and this is the story. This is the story that uh, we have of this lady who lived so long ago but i think we can still hear her voice if we really want to and she has a message for us and if we are quiet if we stay in silence this message we can still hear uh, thank you for your attention